we started this morning with a brand new series for the month of November, and uh, we're going to call it The Good Life, okay? I want to share with you something that Gilbert Chesterton said, and uh, several years ago, when I started pastoring, it's been several now, 21 years ago, uh, early on in those years, uh, I, I, I didn't have a lot to pull from. I was a, a fairly new Christian, and uh, I ran across... Uh, the writings of uh, Gilbert Chesterton, and they have been very influential, to say the least. And this is one of those quotes that I pull out every year because it reminds me of a very great point. He says, when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or whether you take them with gratitude. Now, all of us have this choice. We have it every single day as to how we take life. And as I, as I talk about this today and introduce this series, I, I want to be transparent with you and upfront. Uh, at no point in time am I insinuating that we live perfect lives as Christians. We are far from it, okay? And we're never going to be those people that nail it every day and have that perfect, thankful heart. And, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about choosing intentionality in our spiritual walk. And we do have the ability to take uh, life with gratitude. We can choose to do that. And so as we begin this series on the good life, everybody knows November is about Thanksgiving. How many of you are excited about Thanksgiving? You love Thanksgiving? Well, let me go a little quick and pop too cold here. This is not even through my notes, but I'm curious. How many of you guys decorate for Christmas before Thanksgiving? Let me see your hands. How many of you do it like the day after? Some of you don't decorate at all. Okay. <laughs> I'm one of those guys, I love Christmas. I'm, a, I'm obnoxiously in love with Christmas. And uh, some people think that means I don't care about Thanksgiving. It's quite the contrary. In my mind, I see them together. I kind of see the holiday season as a, 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 a time that connects with Thanksgiving and Christmas. And so I'm excited about Thanksgiving. Uh, I love pretty much everything about it. And uh, so that's what November is all about. So here's where we're going with our series. I believe that a life of giving thanks is the key to the good life. That's what the good life is, is a person who has found a way to take life with gratitude. Um, a life of Thanksgiving is not always the easiest life, but I believe it is absolutely the good life. And you know, I've met a lot of people, as you have over the years, and I've met some very successful people, uh, very successful people, uh, and then I've met some people that in the world's eyes, you know, don't have a lot. And I've met successful people that were happy, and I've met successful people that were miserable. I've met poor people that were happy, and I've met four people that were miserable. I've concluded in my life, as many of you have, that what people have is not the key to the good life. It's not the key to the good life. The key is that people who are thankful for what they have is the key to the good life. And let me be clear. Being thankful doesn't mean you have to be poor. You can be successful and thankful, but you don't have to have a ton of to be thankful, okay? So the key to the good life is, is living with an intentional thankful posture. Now, this goes without saying to, to the church, as Christian people, uh, you and I are called to intentionally carry ourselves with a spirit of thanksgiving. Scripture tells us from uh, the entirety of the Bible that part of uh, what should resonate from us as we hear, uh, you know, the, the chorus of grace in our life, uh, thanksgiving should resonate from the way we live. It should, be, it should be intentional and we should choose to do that. And so we're talking about the good life this month because I simply believe that if we'll do that, if we'll be thankful, we'll find that, that that's the richest way to live. So 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 18 is a verse I'm not sure all of you have heard many, many times. Paul says... Be thankful in all circumstances. For this, and we'll talk about that in a moment, it's important what this is. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. 
All right, let's pray over this series. Father, uh, our goal here at Noble Church as we pray over this series today is to do two things. Lord, number one, the chief goal of mankind is to glorify you. So we pray as a collective body that this series, everything said, everything done, every worship song sang, every lyric, every every voice, every uh, 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 thing said, the messages will glorify you. The second thing we pray that it will do will be encourage people to see how good you are and to choose to live the good life by being thankful. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will. So what is God's will? God's will is that you and I learn how to be thankful in all circumstances. Now at first glance, I've got to be honest with you, um, at first glance, uh, it seems like this verse is a little bit on the impossible side. It can even read like it implies that it's maybe cruel. Now, I've told you this before, I want to say it again, but when I got saved in 1993, I didn't have any church background, okay? I did not uh, know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about Christianity or, or Scripture. And I started reading the Bible, and, and I really got a passion for it because I was reading it for the first time. And it, I look back now, and what I realized is that my reaction to Scripture was very honest because I had not been conditioned by the tradition of my church and my heritage. And that's not bad. But I didn't have that tradition to filter the Scripture. And so there were Scriptures that I read that my reaction to God was, I don't agree with that. Or I don't understand that. Or why would you say that? And I wasn't saying that to argue with God. That was just my honest reaction and this is one of the verses that in all transparency, when I read it, I really wasn't sure how I was going to take it. Because it almost seemed like God was saying, learn to be thankful for terrible things. In all circumstances, be thankful. And of course, I know that we all get to a point where we go, okay, how in the world can I be thankful for tragedy or death or pain? And how is being thankful in all of these bad things the good life? I mean, that doesn't sound like the good life to me. So I know you know this if you've been in church any point in time, part of time, but maybe some of you are new. Uh, the key here is, is not anything in depth, but it is important. The key is understanding this verse that in all circumstances does not mean for all circumstances. The thankful life is the ability to be thankful in a bad situation, just like we're thankful in a good situation, but that doesn't mean I have to be thankful for that situation. Several years ago, when my son was a child, we went through a 10-day window where we thought, according to the doctor we had, that he had a terminal illness. And those were the 10 longest days of my life. And, and I remember in those days feeling so overwhelmed, but I remember sensing the Holy Spirit prompting me to be thankful. He was not prompting me to be thankful for my son's terminal illness, which I thought he had at that time. That, that's ridiculous. He was prompting me to be thankful while I was in that situation. And then, I, I don't want to take this message a different direction, but I want to say this to you because I feel like maybe it's for someone here. The key to your breakthrough so many times is being able to sever the tentacles of the pain yeah. over your ability to be thankful to God. And that's a connection that you don't have the ability intellectually to make. That disconnection, you have to do it because you understand God never called you to be thankful for bad things. He just called you to stand there in the middle of that bad thing and be thankful to Him regardless of the bad thing. Okay, so that's why, that's why I'm going with this, all right? So I want to give you a couple of reasons today why the thankful life is the good life. All right, well, we've got to start with the reality that God has never been, is not, and will never be the author of evil. 
He can't. God is the author of good. So in James chapter 1, verse number 17, James says, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our, our Father, who created all the lights in heaven. He never changes, and he never casts a shifting shadow. What does that mean? It means God never it says or does one thing and then all of a sudden becomes something else and shifts over here and says or does something else. He doesn't change. He is the same and he's good. So if God is the author of good, God is the author of light, God is the author of blessing, and God is the author of uh, positive things that flow from him. Okay? He is not the author of evil. Now, i got to be honest with you. Uh, this seems simple, but you will you will struggle to find a topic that has been any more hotly debated and that has confused the church over the centuries any more than this subject. It's even been preached from pulpits and taught in seminaries and different layers that you know God somehow contributed to. Or cause, yeah. or spawn, or produce evil. Now I've got to tell you that I, I understand that we get confused sometimes and we say things that we don't really understand what we're saying because we don't have a good answer. But but for the moment, I, I just want to pause and I'm going to explain something to you the best I can. Now I'm not a theologian, I can tell you that, uh, but I've studied this for twenty something years, and, and I'm going to tell you that evil never comes from God. Okay, let me tell you where evil does come from. Evil comes, number one, from Satan. Satan is a real being. He was, he was Lucifer, the archangel created by God. Make a point here, he was not created evil. So God did not create Lucifer evil. Lucifer was created in perfection just like the other angels. And then God, at some level that we don't fully understand, Gave the angels in that in a season a certain amount of the free will that humanity possesses today. I don't think they still have that choice. Maybe they do. I don't know. But but they had something because Lucifer chose to rebel against God, and sin was found in him. People say all the time, Pastor, where did sin come from? It came from Lucifer. That's where it originated at, was in his desire to be like God. And the Bible tells us very clearly that Satan has a threefold agenda on this earth. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Okay? This is the spawning bed of evil, and it even predates the fall of man and the evil that ensued from there. So the beginning of evil comes from Satan. All right? Evil in our world also comes because sometimes we as human beings make choices that produce evil consequences. Just recently the world, the world watched in horror and wept with tears over the people murdered in, in uh, was it Pittsburgh? The Jews that were murdered out of a, a... You know what evil? Evil is not prejudice, friends. Evil shoots churches. Evil kills Jews. Evil kills Muslims. Evil kills Christians. Evil kills Hindus. We see that somebody made a decision to murder people and the consequence of their choice produced evil in our world. So evil comes from Satan. Evil comes from bad choices. And then there is another area of evil that I really don't have the ability to explain to you because sometimes things happen that we don't know the answer for. Yeah. And we don't have control over them. They're not a direct reaction or a consequence of something we've done. And we can't necessarily show Satan's hand on it, although he's somewhere beyond in the background. And so that's where evil comes. Evil doesn't come from God. In all things, at all times, God is good. And I know the church has kind of adopted that, that little saying over the years that God is good all the time, but we need to meditate on that sometimes because when you and I are overwhelmed with evil, I, I'm not a counselor, I'm a psychologist, I'm not even a counselor, okay? But I learned this about people because I learned it about myself. When you and I are in pain, we feel the need 
to find someone to blame. We need a person that is responsible. We've got to be able to direct. Uh, it's amazing how therapeutic it can be to find someone or something to blame. And when we can't, we struggle kind of in limbo there with wanting to direct this blame. And, and, and I know that that's where sometimes we get this crazy idea that somehow God is to blame for the atrocities of this world. But I'm telling you, friends, God not the author of evil. He has never been, he is not, and he cannot be. God is good at all times, okay? So look, Matthew Henry said this. He said, it's never so bad with us, but it might be worse. We can never have reason to complain of God. Never. And have always much reason to praise and to give thanks. God is never evil. Alright? So, the thankful life is the good life because God is the author of good and not the author of evil. So when I have evil in my life, when I'm facing evil, my role is to, to understand that it's not from God be thankful in any situation and follow God's plan in the midst of that situation, even if I'm in encountering evil. You know, Jesus came to the earth and he taught the way you overcome evil is with good. You love those who hurt you. You do good to those who persecute you. You don't look at that evil and say, well, that's God's fault. No, you take what is God, which is love and good, and you combat the evil that is not God by living in the principle that he taught us. So I, I'm thankful because God's the author of good. That's the good life. Another reason the thankful life is the good life is because God is always in control. Now, I know it, not what I just said kind of seems a little counter to what I said prior because point number one kind of makes it seem like that all these things spiral out of control and Satan's running around in free will and that God's not in control. That's not true. That's not what I mean. Satan does have a certain amount of free reign. Uh, that's not God's fault, that's our fault. We gave him the keys when Adam and Eve sinned. Okay? Uh, but God controls even the works of Satan. Not just New Testament, Old Testament. When, when Satan decided he would attack Job, God set the parameters and said, You can do this, but you can't do that. I will allow this, but you would not be able to do that. So the reason the thankful life is the good life is because God is always in control. He's in control of my good seasons. He's in control of my difficult season. Now, a verse that all of you know is Romans 8 28, right? And it's, I want you to read with me. It says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Now, the reason I give this verse is because the wording in this verse is critical, just like the wording in uh, the verse I read for our text of 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, okay? In this particular verse, it does not say everything is good. I know you know that. It says not, it, it doesn't say everything is good in our lives. It says God has the ability to work good in the middle of everything in our lives. He works in the midst of all things to be able to bring good, orchestrate good, create good, direct things to produce good in our lives. And God can do that even when we're standing in terrible situations. So this week I, I was challenged a little bit, actually a couple weeks ago as I was preparing these messages. I started thinking to myself, what is the worst example, or the best example of the worst time in the world where something terrible happened and God used it for good? And I really started, the Holy Spirit started dealing with me about how much Satan knew about God's redemptive plan when he crucified Jesus. And I'm convinced that Satan did not know that Jesus' death on the cross would be the redemptive purchase of humanity, or he would not. Satan is evil, but he's not ignorant. I don't think he would have murdered Jesus had he known what was going to happen. I believe that he felt that if he could kill Jesus, he would stop the redemptive plan of God. So, as I'm thinking about this, I, I think back through the, the uh, events of that particular uh, encounter and 
all that Jesus went through. Uh, don't have time to get into it today, but let's put it this way. Let me put it this way. It was the most heinous, horrendous, false trial uh, and murder known to humanity. Okay? Isaiah tells us that Jesus was beaten to a place that even his closest friends could look him right in the face and not recognize who he was. Not an inch, not an inch of his flesh did not have a tear. Some of the ancient writers report that he was so lacerated on his back from the Roman cat of nine tails that his kidneys and different organs were visible at certain points in time. Now, why do I tell you that? I'm telling you that because I believe that's about as bad as it gets. And Satan thought he was winning. But from that and in that, God orchestrated the salvation of the human race. He let Satan do what he was doing. Not because he wasn't in control, but because he was in control. And he allowed the redemptive plan to work out. And Satan thought he won. But God always has the last word. And it was actually the first word, not the last word. But that's how God is. And so God took what Satan meant for evil. And he brought out of it the salvation of humanity. Friends, what I'm trying to say to you this morning is that when Satan does something in your life that is meant to destroy you, that is meant to destroy your children, that is meant to destroy your business, or that is meant to bring you pain and suffering, if you and I learn how to just be thankful in it, not for it, we take our hands off and allow God to do what he does best, and that is reach down in the middle of, of, of horrendous things and bring out something powerful and beautiful. You know the power of this is, is if we can get this, and I'm not saying it's easy, I'm saying it's, it's the best way to do it. If we can be thankful in times like this, we take Satan's power away. His whole life is broken, not because we change, we don't change anything about the situation, but we change his ability to manipulate us because we've let go and we're thankful in all things. Because God is in control. He's still able to do something good. He's still able to bring triumph out of tragedy. He's able to bring healing out of death. He's able to bring uh, a joy out of pain. Beauty from ashes. Rejoicing from suffering. I mean, this is God's specialty that if I just will get in a posture of thanksgiving and and humble myself before the Lord. I don't have to be thankful for it. That's ridiculous. But I can be thankful in it. That God is in control. He sets above all things. The, the Old Testament says he sits on the circle of the earth. And the earth is his, they're like a footstool at his feet. And he's able to manipulate and reach down and work anything and everything in a way. That can bring, that can bring tragedy. Uh, triumph out of tragedy. So I want you to get a, a couple more things. Uh, God's always in control. Okay? And He never, ever allows anything in my life because He wishes to harm me. Now let's be careful here. The word harm, I'm talking harm. I'm not saying He's, I'm not using harm and correct in the same way. Because God does allow things in my life to correct me. Okay? And no, Pastor, He would never do that. Oh, he loves me enough. That if I'm committed to him, he's committed to me, and I need correction, he will correct me. Okay, that's love, that's not hate. That's love, that's not evil. But aside from correction, God will never allow anything in our life because he has a desire of harm. And I've heard people say before, you know, things that I know they were speaking out of pain, but it almost sounded like God was doing it to hurt them. God would never hurt you. All of the anger and the wrath and the frustration that he had before sin, he poured it out in one spot in one person. And that was on Jesus as he hung on the cross and the moon turned to blood and the sky went dark and God turned his face. But for a moment, all of his anger was poured out on Jesus. 
That's why Jesus, who rose from the dead, said that if we have faith in him, we traded places with him. That's why grace is good news, is because God's no longer angry at me. And we ever let anybody tell you God's angry at you. All of God's anger was poured out in the sin deposit uh, at Calvary, okay? So God never allows anything to wish his heart. Let me put it this way. I may not understand his action, I may not understand his plan, I may not understand his method, but God's always in control, he's always good because he simply can't be evil. Sometimes our simplest statements are the most profound, and this is one that you have to chew on a little bit. He can't be evil. He can't want to, but if he wanted to, which he can't want to because he can't be evil, but if he could want to be evil, he can't. I don't know if you've ever listened to the late R.C. Sproul, but uh, he was one of the world's greatest preachers on the holiness of God. People ask all the time, Pastor, what is God's chiefest attribute? And most of the time we would answer love, but that's incorrect. His chiefest attribute, what he is the most of, is holy. Love flows from holiness. His holiness is so rich and pure, with no contamination and no unholy, anti-holy, anything not holy. He is so completely holy that he can't be evil because evil is unholy. God is good all the time. That's why the thankful life is the good life. When I have no idea what God is doing in my life. One thing I do know, he's not evil. It didn't come from him. God's good. Another reason that the thankful life is the good life is because the things that matter most don't depend on our circumstances. So I can be thankful regardless of what I'm facing in my life. My salvation doesn't depend on my situation. It depends on my justification. Romans 3 and 24 says God freely and graciously delivers uh, that we have declared that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sin. I am justified not because of anything I've done. It is because Jesus paid the price for me and declared me righteous and I just received the status that he gives me. You know, you know have you ever thought about if you could go back in the history of the church and correct anything what you would correct? I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about God. God's perfect, but the church is not. And over the years, in the history of the church, if you never studied church history, it's fascinating. It's, it's, a, it's, it's incredible. Uh, it'll make you swell with pride. It'll make you weep with tears. It's, it's been great. It's been horrendous. And one of the things about it is that there's been flaws in the church and errors and all of these heresies and these things that have affected us and, 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 and changed us and taken away our power and limited our abilities and all of these things over the years. And if I can correct one thing, uh, you gave me a little glimpse into the weirdness of my brain today. These are the kinds of things I think about. If I could go back and correct one error of the church, it would be that we somehow work or earn our salvation. I think it's the greatest lie that's ever came from the fullness of the world. And we would never stand up and say, but we did things like this. We say, well, we're saved by grace, but we're saved by grace and, or we're saved by grace. This. No, that's it. That's it. My justification is not dependent on what you think about my holiness or my law or my adherence to Christian principles. It's not, then yours isn't based on what I think about yours or the Pope or the Presbyter or anybody else. It is you and God working out your salvation with fear and trembling after you've been deemed righteous and saved once you. I'm justified. So I can be thankful because I'm saved. Okay? My joy doesn't depend on the outside because it came from the inside. Jesus is not out there giving me joy. He's in here producing joy outside. From the from a man's spirit out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, is what the Bible says. And you can be standing in the middle of terrible things, or you know what? Sometimes that's not what gets us. Sometimes we're just standing in the middle of order. The mundane. Sometimes that's what gets us when we just get lost in the, in the, 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 the chaos.
God, but this nothingness, and even then, even then, joy doesn't come from the outside, joy comes from the inside. That's why the church in the message of Christ is, is uh, it has the ability to be preached and adapt to every culture and every time in the world is because it's an inward flow, not an outward thing. My peace can't be taken from the world because it wasn't given by the world. Philippians 4 and 7 says, you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. Anything we can understand. That's we just don't understand how we got peace. You know, that's pretty much what it says. It will exceed anything we can understand. His peace will guard my heart and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The last thing I want to say about this is, you know, when we face tough times, the Holy Spirit doesn't run away from us. He runs to us. I just want you to have that little picture that the thankful life is the good life because God's not running from you when the chips are down. God's running to you when the chips are down. When things are good, He's running to you. When things are bad, He's running to you. The fact that you're here this morning, friend, means God has ran to you. He's called to you. He's prompted you. He's brought you. I close with this. At age 53, John, John Fraley found himself pretty miserable in life. This is a true story. He had a small law firm uh, close, uh, close to Axel, close to Apple headquarters uh, in California, and it was failing. He was struggling. He had gone through a second divorce. It was very painful for him. His two older children had grown distant from him, and he was very afraid that he was fixing to lose contact with his younger daughter. <laughs> he was living in a tiny apartment where he was freezing in the winter and cooking in the summer because he couldn't pay the power bill. He was 40 pounds overweight. His girlfriend had broken up with him. It's kind of like a country song, right? Is that really good? <laughs> I love country. Uh, he was in a tough spot, man. He, he had, a, he had a, a professional degree. He had a law firm. People weren't paying the bills. He couldn't pay his bills. And he, he actually was getting to the point of being pretty suicidal, real close. Read his story. So one day, out of desperation, he decided uh, it was New Year's Day, actually. His mind was racing about New Year's resolutions and different things, and um, he was just in a terrible, terrible spot, dark place. He decided he'd go for a walk. And on this walk, he went out to a, a, an area, of, a little wooded area there close to him. Uh, he had what he calls uh, an epiphany. By the way, he's not a Christian, he doesn't believe in God. And I'll tell you why I'm telling you this story in a minute. He had this moment where it came to him that if he would try to be thankful, maybe his life would become tolerable and maybe he could at least survive and not make it hard. If he could just learn to focus on what he did have instead of what he didn't have. And so there in the woods, he made a, a pact with himself. He set the goal that for the next 365 days of the next year, every day he was going to handwrite one thank you note to someone. Okay? And so one by one, day after day, he started handwriting thank you notes for some gift or act of kindness that someone had done to him in the past. Uh, business associates, college friends, Doctors, store clerks, handymen, neighbors, anyone, really absolutely anyone that he could recollect had done something even remotely nice to him. And for, for 365 days, every single day, he took a pen and a small thank you card and he hand wrote a thank you. He, he reports that immediately and then later significantly he began to experience benefits in his life that he had never felt before. Financial gain began to happen. He found true friendship. He lost weight. He found inner peace. I'm just telling you what he said. The economy in that particular time collapsed actually around John. The bank across the street from his office fell. But note by note, day by day, thank you by thank you, John's life turned Around. And he was so inspired by this experience that he wrote a book, and you can find it, it's called A Simple Act of Gratitude, How Learning to Say Thank You Changed My Life. If 
pastor, this man wasn't a Christian. Why, why would you tell me that? If the power of thanksgiving can do that for someone who doesn't even realize it was God that gave him the idea and the Holy Spirit that was trying to save his life and prompting him to be thankful and generous can have that kind of power over his life to save his life and turn him around, then you and I as Christians have the ability to engage one of the greatest life-altering powers on earth, and that is a life of being thankful. This is the good life. Would you bow your heads with me? You're in this room today, and you're not a follower of Christ. I know that some of the things I'm saying don't make a lot of sense. And you probably think, well, that's good for you. But that would never work for me. Let, let me tell you, friend, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, there is another world and a life available to you that you cannot imagine. But you can't unlock it with your intellect. You can't unlock it with good works. You can't unlock it because you just want it to be so. The relationship with Jesus is the door to the God-filled life, the good life, the thankful life that will revolutionize your day. I'm not saying things will get better. I'm saying you'll be thankful in it. God will turn some things around. Some things will play out. But in a minute, he'll turn you around. He'll change you. And you'll never be the same. I've got a lot of regrets in my life. But the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ is one that I will never regret for the eternity. So thankful. I'm so thankful. God called to my spirit like He's calling to yours right now. I urge you, don't pass it by. If you're in this room and you're not right with the Lord, you've either never known the Lord Jesus or you're not where you need to be, but you want to pray with me. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand high where we can see it. Would you slip it up right now? We don't want to miss you. Would you just raise your hand? Thank you for that hand. Pastor, I want to connect with the Lord. I want to get my heart right. I want to straighten up my life out. I want to be a thankful person. Is there anybody else? Pastor, I'm so in. Anybody else in this one? We'll take one that's just as important as 10,000. But is there anybody else? Two hands. Thank you for being obedient. For being obedient. All right, family of God, let's all pray together. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe you're the Son of God. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you as you give me the grace and show me how. In Jesus' name, amen.